Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. I'm Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Today, someone asks, Dear Pastor, how would you respond to the plethora of quotations from the fathers which this Roman Catholic website cites in defense of papal supremacy? Churchfathers.org slash authority of the Pope. In other words, my question is, what is the patristic consensus on the papacy? Or is there one? All right, so if you go to churchfathers.org slash authority of the Pope, which we will link in the video description below, there is, as you say, a plethora of quotations from the church fathers, which seem in that context of the website to support papal primacy. There are so many, uh, there are so many patristic citations on the site. We're actually going to take three videos to make it all the way through each one. And the reason for that is what this site is doing, it's engaging in a proof texting, which is terribly misleading. And so we're going to take three videos to go through each and every one of these, as far as the authority of the Pope is concerned. The patristic passages that are presented on this website are presented without any context whatsoever, only within the context that the site presents, which is that these are affirmative for papal primacy. What the site does is it's reading these passages anachronistically, meaning it's reading papal, uh, papal primacy as it eventually developed. They're reading it back into the early church fathers. Some of these passages that we'll look at actually have nothing to do with papal primacy whatsoever. Uh, in fact, some of them don't even, they don't even not deal with papal primacy, but they show Rome's early failed attempts to exercise primacy over other bishops and churches. So while the website here referenced is correct that there is a Catholic consensus of the early church about the papacy, it's the opposite of what this website presents it to be. So without further ado, let's start walking through the first of the patristic citations. And the first one comes from 1 Clement. It comes from 1 Clement chapters 1, chapters 58 and 59 and 63. And it goes like this. Owing to the sudden and repeated calamities and misfortunes which have befallen us, we must acknowledge that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the matters in dispute among you, beloved, and especially that abominable and unholy sedition alien and foreign to the elect of God, which a few rash and self-willed persons have inflamed to such madness that your venerable and illustrious name, worthy to be loved by all men, has been greatly defamed. Accept our counsel, and you will have nothing to regret. If anyone disobey the things which have been said by him, God, through us, that is that you must reinstate your leaders, let them know that they will involve themselves in transgression and in no small danger." You will afford us joy and gladness if being obedient, obedient to the things which have been written through, uh, which we have written through the Holy Spirit, you will root out the wicked passion of jealousy. Now, before we get into the text itself, we need to say here that Clement did not write this epistle in his own name, but on behalf of the entire church in Rome. Based on his counsel to the Corinthians in the epistle, it also appears then that Clement uh, was not the single and only bishop at Rome at this time, but rather that Rome, like Corinth, to which the city to which the letter is addressed, was governed by a college of presbyters. In 1 Clement 47, verse 6, Clement describes the conflict in Corinth as a rebellion against its presbyters. In 44, 4, he writes, it is no small sin for us if we depose from the bishop's office those who have offered the gifts blamelessly and in holiness. Blessed are those presbyters who have gone on ahead, who took their departure at a mature and fruitful age, for they need no longer fear that someone may remove them from their established place. So the men who were removed in Corinth were presbyters who yet held the bishop's office. This is similar to Acts 20 verse 17, where Paul calls the elders, the presbyteroi, the presbyters of the church, and tells them in verse 28 of that chapter that the Holy Spirit has made them overseers, or episcopoi, bishops of the flock. Roman Catholic theologian uh, Francis Sullivan, in his work uh, From Apostles to Bishops, reminds us, quote, in the past, Catholic writers have interpreted this intervention as an early exercise of Roman primacy. But now it is generally recognized as the kind of exhortation one church could address to another without any claim to authority over it. End quote. 
So there wasn't a mon episcopate at the time of Clement, either in Corinth or in Rome. Now, as far as the specific verses of 1 Clement, Sullivan again writes, In the first of these passages, it is important to note that, di that disobeying what has been said by him, that is, by Christ, through the letter of the Romans, would entangle certain people in sin. End quote. Regarding the second passage that this website cites, he writes, Here again, some have seen an exercise of Roman primacy, but most scholars nowadays, including Catholics, interpret this rather as an expression of confidence that the Holy Spirit has spoken through what they have written. Whereas papists used to read papal primacy into First Clement, now they see that such claims aren't sustained, sustained by the text or the context of the epistle. We can move on then to the second citation, which is from the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, 2, 4, 3, which says, Therefore you, Hermas, write two little books and send one to Clement, Bishop of Rome, in quotes there, and one to Grapte. Clement shall then send it to the cities abroad, because that is his duty. Now this citation from the Shepherd of Hermas, along with the entire Shepherd of Hermas, demonstrate that, again, like we saw in Clement's time, there was no single bishop of the Roman church. The angel tells Hermas, therefore you shall write two little books and send one to, bishop, uh, one to Clement and one to Grapte. Clement shall then send it to the cities abroad because that is his duty. But the angel continues to speak after this website is done quoting. him, And that angel says, but you yourself read it to this city along with the elders who preside over the church. Elders in Greek is presbyteroi, which is pastors or priests, and is plural, not singular. The phrase in this city, then, is generally understood to be Rome. Again, we can go to Francis Sullivan, who agrees and says, The leadership of Rome at this time was collegial, as it was in Corinth at the end of the first century. End quote. This passage from Hermas, along with the entire shepherd of Hermas, has absolutely nothing to say whatsoever about papal primacy in the early church because it didn't exist. The next quotation on the website comes from one of my favorite church fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, and his epistle to the Romans. The first citation comes from Ignatius' salutation. Ignatius to the church which also holds the presidency in the location of the country of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of blessing, worthy of praise, worthy of success, worthy of sanctification, and because you hold the presidency in love. Ignatius' words here, that the Church of Rome holds the presidency in the location of the country of the Romans, is a crummy translation of Ignatius. It's better translated as, presides in the place of the district of the Romans. The Greek word that he uses is much narrower than the broad translation, location. It's a district, rather. It's a limited area, such as a city or a town. And then, also, the phrase holds the presidency in love is also better translated as presiding over love. Now, this doesn't mean then that the Roman church presides over the entire church Catholic, but that the Roman church is preeminent in giving charity to other brethren and congregations in need. This website, churchfathers.org, then goes on to cite Romans 3 verse 1 from Ignatius. You, that is the church of Rome, have envied no one but others you have taught. I desire only that you have joined your, in your instructions may remain in force. So when Ignatius writes that the Roman church has taught others, he's likely referring to something like 1 Clement, in which the church at Rome taught the Corinthians the antidote for their divisions. But none of this suggests any sort of papal primacy whatsoever. And again, the translation presides in the place of the district of the Romans, then negates any sort of papal primacy over other churches outside of Rome itself. The final uh, quotation from churchfathers.org that we want to look at in this video here is Dionysus of Corinth's epistle to Soter, who was the bishop of Rome, uh, and it's recorded in Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History. Dionysius writes, for from the beginning it has been your custom to do good to all the brethren in various ways and to send contributions to all the churches in every city. This custom of your blessed Bishop Soter, your, this custom, excuse me, your blessed Bishop Soter has not only preserved, but is augmenting 
by furnishing an abundance of supplies to the saints and by urging with consoling words, as a loving father, his children, the brethren who are journeying. Today we have observed the Lord's holy day in which we have read your letter. Whenever we do read it, we shall be able to profit thereby, as we, also, as we do also when we read the earlier letter written to us by Clement. Dionysius is thanking Soter for the charity that the Roman church sent to the Corinthian congregation, and he's thanking him for Soter's epistle, which was, he says, full of consoling words as a loving father to his children, to brethren who are journeying. Dionysius' letter, it doesn't demonstrate any sort of papal primacy in the sense of authority over the Corinthians, but much as Ignatius writes to the Romans, the Roman church is preeminent in providing charity and encouragement to other churches. Rome was able to excel in Christian charity because of its size and its wealth. But that charity, along with epistles of encouragement and teaching to other churches, none of that demonstrates any sort of papal primacy of the Bishop of Rome other, over other churches whom it assists monetarily or spiritually. So, so far, we've seen in all of these passages quoted by this website, nothing that actually demonstrates papal primacy in the early church. Check out part two.